There are uh, three levels that we're going to switch between in this project, which you can download in the description. And uh, we aren't going to keep any other data besides player rotation and position, as I'll cover that in a future video. In this one, I'm simply going over how to switch between levels of multiple entrances and exits. So we need to keep the player position and rotation, in other words. As of now, level 1 does not have any triggers in place, and therefore cannot switch between levels. We need to set up a single thing called Scene Switcher, you know, that's included in the project, that will have a function called Change Scene. The function will accept a string called Path that we'll use to switch scenes with GetTree.ChangeScene and then pass in the path. Next, we're going to need a trigger to call this function in the singleton. The scene of the trigger will have an area with a mesh instance and a collision shape as its children. The mesh instance is for debugging so we can see where the trigger is. We need to make a script for the trigger and we will connect the signals from the area body entered and body exited to the script. You could use either one for this, but they will have different effects. It's better to use body entered in my experience, so I'm going to use that one for this tutorial. But I'm putting both of them in the script just in case you might want to use the other one for some reason. We are going to need a scene trigger holder scene that will hold all the scene triggers inside a level. I'll go into more detail later, but for now let's get back to the triggers. And the function connected to the signal body entered, we need to check to see if the body passed in is a Ken and Mac body and is a player. The player check is easy, we're just going to add the player to a group and just check if whatever Ken and Mac body is passed in is a part of that group. We're going to use the isInGroup method and then pass in a string called player into it, so we're going to need to add the player to that group called player. Then we will call the change scene function in our singleton and pass in a variable called path to it. This will be an export variable that we'll keep in the scene and uh, we're, we're just going to enter in a path through the editor like just right clicking and copying the, the path from a scene and just pasting it into there. And uh, just keep in mind that the path is of type string just like it is in the single thing. I like to default the string to res colon slash slash uh, to tell whoever is using it that uh, we're going to pass in a path to this. Now we want to uh, instance the scene trigger holder and the uh, scene trigger as a child of the scene trigger holder to our level. And we can place it in whichever location we want, you know, the scene trigger. And uh, just make sure that it's not touching any walls and that the player cannot get uh, past that, uh, that trigger without touching it. So that way we actually load the next level once they go through it. And uh, yeah. So uh, when we change scenes, we'll arrive at whichever spot we placed our player in the next scene. So it's going to basically act like we're restarting the scene like as soon as we get to the next one. We don't want this because we want to be able to enter a level from multiple locations. And that is what I'm going to go over up ahead. We need to transfer over the player and uh, trigger information to give the player the correct location inside the next scene. So we're going to pass in not just a path, but also a body and a trigger to our singleton's change scene function. So we'll pass in body and self to the uh, change scene function. We'll edit the change scene function in the singleton script and make it accept a player param and a trigger param. Players of type kinematic body and triggers of type spatial, which is just our scene's types. You might have some different ones in your project. Uh, next, we're going to uh, find the relative difference of positions between player and the trigger. We will keep a variable inside the singleton that keeps track of this. Basically, we don't want the player to start off in a default location. We want them to start off based on where the trigger is in the next scene. We are going to subtract the global transform.origin of the player by the trigger's global transform.origin. This will give us a relative vector between the player and the trigger. And we'll give this vector to the relative player position variable in the singleton. Now we are going to add a trigger to the same spot within the next level, which is level 2 by the way. And this will be the location that our player will be transferred to when we change scenes. So now we can go back and forth between both levels, but we're still going to the specified spot. And I'll fix that in a sec. To get the correct location of the trigger we're looking for, we're going to use the scene trigger holder. First off though, we need to create an array that will store all the triggers in our current scene. It will be initialized to an empty array in the singleton that we have, and uh, anytime a scene is loaded with the trigger holder, then we'll give all of our triggers to this array. In our change scene function, don't forget to clear the array before changing the scene. So that way the next time we come in, the only triggers that are going to be in the array are just the current triggers in the current scene under uh, scene trigger holder. Next, we'll iterate through all the holder's children and give it to the scene switcher's array that we just created. We'll just grab that array from the singleton and then use the append method and then just put the node in there. Now, we need to be able to change the player's location. 
This is where the method I'm using gets a little bit weird. To be able to change a player's location, we need both the player and all the triggers to be ready. This means that in the scene tree, the player must be before the scene trigger holder instance. That way, we know the player will be loaded by the time we try to administer changes to the player. After that, we're going to call a different function named scene setup in the singleton. We have not created this method yet, but we are going to create it right now in the singleton. Before we start writing the setup scene function, we need to give our triggers IDs. We can do this by simply adding an export int variable named ID to all of our trigger scenes. Next, now that we got that done, we are going to have to make a function called getID that we'll use to return our ID and check if we have that function. We're going to make a variable that will hold that ID in the scene switcher scene, and then we'll give the ID of the current trigger before changing the scene. This way, when we get to the next scene, we can check against the trigger IDs in that scene that we switched to. Then we're going to iterate through all the triggers that we have after the scene switch and search for one with the same ID. First, we're going to have to check if we have that function before comparing IDs. If we find one that matches, we're going to add that trigger's global transform.origin to the relative player position variable to put the player in front of the trigger after the scene switch. This way, the player doesn't start at the origin when switching scenes. We'll need to add a signal and pass in the relative player position to the player after the scene switch. We'll do this by emitting the signal right after the relative player position addition, and then we'll just pass in the relative player position right there. We will connect the signal to a function called player setup, and the parameter named position will set our player's global transform.origin to the relative player position that is in front of the trigger. We're going to make a boolean in the scene switcher singleton to make sure that we don't accidentally trigger the scene switcher when we're just trying to load into the game. Right before we switch scenes, we'll set it to true, and uh, after checking through all the IDs, we'll set the scene switch to false. Then, we'll return from the function to avoid going through the rest of the array unnecessarily. In the scene trigger holder, we're going to check if the scene switch is true before iterating through all the triggers in our current scene. This will be the part where we uh, keep from uh, activating the scene switcher when just loading in. If you did everything correctly, you should enter an infinite scene switching limbo. That's what I call it. It just keeps switching scenes, and when you get to the next scene, it'll switch back to the old scene. So that's basically what's happening. Okay, so now we need to set these scene triggers correctly. So if you notice I kept in the center, uh, what we want to do is we want to keep uh, this, the global origin of this whole scene in the middle, in the center of the door on both scenes. So what I'll do is I'll like make edible children and then move the area a little bit past it. That way, this is still in the center. And in level 2, I'm going to keep the center in the middle again, make edible children again. And as you notice, we're coming from this way this time. So I'm going to set past it this way. So I'm going to set, boom. Whoops. I didn't move the area. Boom. Okay. So let's do this. So this should work right here. The only problem is we won't have the right rotation. See? Now it's not switching scenes forever. We're out of the range of the other one. That's also why I didn't want it too thick. Now we want to transfer over the player rotation. This will be of type Vector3, and with the first person character controller, we're only rotating the camera and a pivot point. They're only rotating on one axis each, so we can just add them together and get the full rotation in our function called getRotation. Your controller may be different, but just make sure that you transfer over all the axes of rotation correctly, and then you'll get the correct rotation on the next scene. First we're going to check if the player has a get rotation function, and then we'll use that get rotation function and give it to the player rotation variable in the scene switcher singleton. Now we need to update our signal to require a rotation parameter to pass into the function player setup in our player scene. We'll only give the x axis of the rotation to the camera, and we'll give the y axis of the rotation to the spatial's rotation, or the pivot's rotation. Don't forget to put rotation. Boom! It almost looked like we didn't even like switch. See how instant that was? It's so motherfucking cool. Now if you have more stuff in the scene, of course it would take longer to load, but there's ways you could do you could load in Godot by background loading. But yeah, this will just give you the general thing of how to do scene switching. So uh now the reason why we did all that location stuff, that way we could have multiple entrances to level three. So there's two ways to get into level three. We could drop down here. 
Or we could go around, uh, let's see. Or we could go around this way. So in level one, we, we want to add a trigger, another trigger. And this is also why we have a loop right here, because we want to go through all of them and uh, add all of them to the list. Okay, so uh, we're going to add another one, scene trigger. And as you can see, once again, I'm aiming for the center first. So I want to aim for the center of the doorway first. And then afterwards, I will offset it so that we won't uh, keep infinitely bumping into the same scene trigger over and over again. And let's make it an ID of one. All right, so uh, that's all we need, I think, for that one. And uh, well, also, we need to make it uh, center. So I think it's about center. About right there. Make it uh, give edible children. Go a little past that, and boom. Okay, so let's go to level three. Make a similar thing. Okay, boom, 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 boom. No way to give out. Okay, edible children. Go this way, and then make it a little bit past it. About right there. And that should be about right. So it's got the path back to level one. I think I did the path in here too. Yep, let's do this. So it should do it correctly. Let's see. And now it's all mo fucking loaded. Hell yeah. Okay, so let's see. Oh wait, I forgot to check if it goes back. Let's just do that real quick. Just to make sure. Boom, it works. Okay, so now we got uh, that working. Now we need to make another scene that go, we need to make another trigger that goes to level three and let's make it through here. So let's start in level one again. Add this another scene trigger. Add the correct path. See how thick that is? I don't want it to be too thick. It's too thick. About that, I usually like about like that. Okay. Make it about center where you want, and then make edible children. So we want a little bit past that. It's a little bit down there. And boom, there we have it. Okay, so let's go to level three. Do the same thing, edible children. Make sure it goes past where we want to. That right here. Okay. So boom, I think this is going back to level one. Okay, so we don't really need to test that one. That's very unlikely that they will come back. But yeah, so right here, this is working. That's working. Okay, and uh, we go through here and boom, it's all loaded. Remember earlier, this wasn't loaded? Now it is, this is what it looks like. So you go through here, go over here, and come back to level one. I see. Come on, let's go. Boom! Boom! We're all switching through the scenes. We're able to go, to, go into all of them without having to do anything. And uh, after you're done with all this, it barely takes any code to actually set it up. You just have to have an ID. And uh, here's an optional thing. I'll just go over it real quick. So, um, in the scene trigger, we have a mesh instance. So, we could like maybe make a boolean. It's like bool var visible trigger. Just for debugging purposes. Let's just make it false by default. So um, if not visible trigger, then we're just going to go through the areas children dot for wait, whoops, node in area dot get children and if those nodes are mesh instances and queue them free because we don't want to see them whoops node dot queue free <laughs> don't fuck up and put queue free okay so we want to go through all of them and just take out all the ones that are so now we can't see them now we're just going through you know it's a bit more of a little jerk that way but it's still almost perfect and bam, there we have it. Now we have it to where we could like go into a scene from multiple entrances. It's still very basic. We're not transferring over data. We're only transferring over this mo fucking rotation and this mo fucking position. That's all we're getting. That's all we're doing. 
But yeah. Okay, so I hope this helped. And I hope you all have a wonderful motherfucking day. And I almost forgot to do something real quick. Uh, this is just a possible glitch. You just want to make sure that uh, even if you uh, get out of this loop somehow, you want to make sure that scene switch is set, set to uh, false afterwards. Just make sure it gets set to that. But yeah. And that's about it right there. Boom. That no matter what scene switch gets set to false, we want to make sure that uh, we know like it's not switching scenes. Boom, it's doing, it's doing, it's doing great, hell yeah.